Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's webinar, CAR T-Cell Therapy for Multiple Myeloma, brought to you by the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation and sponsored by AbV, Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, Celgene, Genentech, Janssen, Cariofarm, Novartis, and Takeda Oncology. It's my pleasure at this time to turn it over to Mary DeRome at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, who will begin the webinar. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Sandra. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary DeRome. I'm Director of Medical Communications and Education at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this webinar. I'd also like to thank AbV, Amgen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Celgene, Genentech, Janssen, Carrier Farm, Novartis, and Takeda Oncology for providing the educational grants to make today's webinar possible. Before we begin, a little bit on the MMRF. The MMRF is a patient-founded organization started in 1998 by Kathy Juicy soon after she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. We have a keen sense of urgency and a laser focus on extending patient lives. As many of you know, multiple myeloma is a highly heterogeneous disease which means every patient's disease is different. So each patient should receive treatment specific to his or her type of myeloma. That is precision medicine. With such a high degree of diversity, the MMRF is focused on generating and aggregating as much patient data as possible to capture the full picture of myeloma. The cornerstone of this effort is our COMPASS study, which now has the largest genomics data set of any cancer. We make sure that data is available to researchers worldwide to develop hypotheses for new, more precise treatments, and then we push those new treatments into clinical trials. This is our precision medicine model. We are already expanding our genomic data collection efforts beyond COMPASS into patients who are in the relapsed refractory setting. And recently, we announced several multi-million dollar investments that leverage this model. Investments in immune therapy, in high-risk disease, and prevention. You can read more about our model and these new initiatives on our website. To follow all the latest research and educational updates, I strongly encourage you not only to visit our website, but also to follow us on Facebook and on Twitter if you're active on those channels. Now I'd like to introduce our three speakers for today's webinar. Dr. Berdeja currently serves as Director of Multiple Myeloma Research and Senior Investigator of Hematologic Malignancies at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute and Attending Physician in the Sarah Cannon Center for Blood Cancer at Tennessee Oncology in Nashville, Tennessee. He specializes in treating patients with all types of blood cancers and those undergoing blood or marrow transplantation. Dr. Berdeja is the lead investigator in many clinical trials for patients with blood cancers and has published and presented extensively on the subject. Dr. Statmauer holds the positions of Professor of Medicine and Section Chief of the Hematologic Malignancies in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. His clinical focus is multiple myeloma, leukemia, lymphoma, and bone marrow and stem cell transplants. Dr. Statmauer has published numerous articles in medical literature, including in such journals as the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Also today, you will hear from Frank Lally, a myeloma patient, on his CAR T-cell therapy experience. Frank is a lifelong journalist, having spent nearly 20 years at Time, Inc. He was the top editor of Money Magazine and also John Kennedy Jr.'s George Magazine. Healthcare became his newsbeat after he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, and he now contributes weekly on healthcare for NPR. In addition, he recently wrote a book for healthcare consumers called Your Best Healthcare Now Get Better Care and Save Money Too. Today, Dr. Berdeja and Dr. Statmauer will provide some insights into some of the different types of CAR T cells and discuss how they are performed in clinical trials. The topics for today's discussion include what CAR T cells are and how they're made, clinical experiences with CD19 or BCMA-directed CAR T cell therapy, 
and the future directions of this type of immunotherapy. Now it's my pleasure to turn the webinar over to Dr. Statmauer. Uh, thank you, Mary, and, and welcome everybody uh, who's uh, listening to the call. Um, it's my pleasure to, uh, to discuss with you um, the exciting area of cellular immunotherapy uh, for myeloma. Um, as you know, uh, immunotherapy has been uh, really an aspect of the treatment of myeloma for, for perhaps uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, the immunomodulatory agents, uh, uh, thalidomide and lenalidomide and pomalidomide, were really the first uh, uh, immunotherapies. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then there's been a lot of work on um, uh, vaccine therapies for myeloma, trying to generate an immune response against myeloma um, in, with various approaches. Uh, the problem is that the, the immune system in a patient with myeloma is relatively um, uh, inactive, and, and so it is sometimes difficult to generate an immune response. The area of monoclonal antibodies have been a, a tremendously exciting area uh, for, for myeloma therapy. It started off with the rituximab for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but now we have the elotuzumab and the daratumumab, which are, are markedly changing the, the, the aspects of, of care for patients with myeloma. But what we're going to focus on today are the cellular therapies, the engineered um, T cells um, uh, of our body in order to make them um, uh, uh, really uh, uh, an armament against uh, myeloma. Um, normal T cells are, uh, are really uh, are key cells in our body to both uh, fight infections, which is what the immune system has been uh, uh, created to do, um, but also um, is, the, is the primary surveillance uh, cell for cancers. And, and so uh, we've, we've known that, that T cells have the ability to, um, to do that, and they do it by having on their surface uh, a, uh, a receptor, something that will latch them, sort of like an antibody, to latch them onto uh, uh, an infection or a tumor or other cells that need to be um, uh, destroyed or, or modified. The problem is that the, 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 these cells are, are not necessarily as potent or as active as they need to be uh, against cancer, number one. And number two, cancer frequently, cancer cells are too much like ourselves, and therefore they are very difficult for cells in our own body to, uh, to differentiate between cancer and non-cancerous cells. And so the philosophy over the last uh, decade has been perhaps we can modify uh, our, our own immune cells to uh, hone in on a particular cancer and, and we can modify them to be much more activated and persistent and expanded uh, to kill the tumor cells. And, and that's what the CAR, CAR T cell, which is uh, where we've put a chimeric antigen receptor on the surface, um, so a new warhead. Or um, we also have some um, engineered cells that put a T cell receptor, that's an affinity enhanced T cell receptor. Um, so it could be CAR T cells or TCR cells um, are both being used in the clinic to try to uh, destroy tumor. The key is to, number one, put on their surface a uh, receptor that will hone in to, uh, to the particular uh, aspect of a tumor you want to destroy, but also um, the, is, is inside, the, the receptor goes through the cell into the center of the cell and actually has what we call co-stimulatory molecules or energizing parts to them that when the receptor latches onto a tumor cell, it causes the, the, this, this altered tumor uh, T cell to activate and become proliferate and become very nasty against whatever it's uh, directed against. 
Um, how do we make these cells? Well, the cells are derived from uh, from the patient. So they're uh, in general, though, though you'll hear a little bit later about other alternatives. But right now, most of these cells come from the patient themselves, and it's removed just like we would remove uh, the cells uh, prior to a stem cell uh, harvest for autologous transplant. Outside the cell, we, we then infect these cells with a virus that carries a genetic material to insert into the cell um, the, the information that it will need in order to create the particular chimeric antigen receptor. We then cook up these cells to proliferate these cells and activate these cells um, and, and, and to freeze them away so they're ready whenever the patient's ready. In the meantime, the patient actually gets uh, a bit of, uh, of, of therapy, uh, of, of not too intensive, but therapy that's designed to suppress their own lymphocytes so that when we give these now um, modified cells, there'll be space for them to proliferate and grow. And, and then we just simply thaw out the cells, transfuse them into the patient, and then they can uh, start growing. And uh, this is just a cartoon that shows the, um, these, these uh, modified T cells, the CAR T cells, which now have on their surface these, um, uh, these warheads. And then what they do is they hone in to the tumor cells, latch onto them. The latching onto the tumor cell causes the CAR T cell to proliferate and activate and become angry so that it ultimately destroys uh, the tumor cell. And, and if these cells can stay around, they can uh, remain sort of serial killers so that should the, the myeloma cells start growing, they, they will destroy this. And as you know, in um, acute lymphocytic leukemia in children and adults with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, this approach has been shown to be successful and has actually been FDA approved. And so um, we're going to spend most of our time talking about what's the information in myeloma. Now, these, these wonderful results that, that you're seeing in, in leukemia and lymphoma and preliminarily in myeloma don't come without some potential toxicity. As these, um, as, as these, uh, 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 these cells latch on to the tumor and pop the tumor, you can get a syndrome called tumor lysis syndrome as the, the garbage that's sort of inside these cells can pop and, and, uh, and so the patients have to be monitored closely. Especially when you're targeting cells like lymphocytes or plasma cells, which make the immune system, um, you can end up destroying nonspecifically some of the normal plasma cells and, and normal B cells. And so you can have a low level of the normal antibodies that's produced. So that's one potential toxicity. There's, a, there's another potential toxicity that, that we were very worried about when this was initially uh, originated, but has proven fortunately to not be a problem, which is whenever you insert genetic material into a cell, that somehow it would cause uh, those cells to become cancers and, 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 and a problem. And, and now with over 2,000 uh, patient years of observation, there has never been any evidence that the infusion of these CAR T cells actually can cause other uh, cancers, fortunately. But then there's the, but there are two real toxicities that we see very frequently. One is called the cytokine release syndrome, where people can get, um, after the infusion of these cells and the proliferation of the cells, a infection-like syndrome of fevers and shaking chills and um, low blood pressure and some shortness of breath. It seems to be driven by inflammatory chemicals uh, interleukin-6 being the number one one, and fortunately, we have the antidote for high levels of interleukin-6. It's called tocilizumab, and it's been miraculous where if these patients uh, experience this syndrome, then just infusing um, uh, some tocilizumab can turn it around and stop the syndrome very quickly. So fortunately, with the observation of this syndrome and the treatment of it, it has not become, it, it really is a real side effect, but not a, a side effect that leads to um, a lot of long-term problems. 
there's also some neurologic toxicity. Some people can get confusion, delirium, sometimes even a seizure. This is much less common, but is but is not really as understood as well. And is an and fortunately, the majority of patients will resolve this syndrome. Um, but it remains uh, an issue that um, that we're still studying. So, so what about the uh, the 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 initial clinical results? Um, the first step, whenever you make a CAR T cell that's targeted against something, you have to figure out what's the best target. And I list here the many um, uh, um, antigens, the many protein globs that are on the surface of myeloma cells uh, that have been tra uh, targeted. And the key to figuring out what um, target to use is you want to do something that's primarily just on the myeloma cells and not on other parts of your body since these, um, these cells can be very potent at killing whatever has the target. And the two um, targets that have been used the most have been CD19, which is the same target that we've been using for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and acute lymphocytic leukemia, and also BCMA, which is called the B-cell maturation antigen, uh, which is uh, restricted really to just plasma cells and B cells. It's really not detected on, on normal tissues, and it's expressed almost universally on myeloma cells. CD19, which is expressed almost universally on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and ALL, is not really seen much in multiple myeloma. However, there's a lot of suggestion that it is seen in the earliest cells of myeloma, in the mother cells. And so potentially CD19 will, uh, directed CAR T cells will kill mother cells while BCMA will kill the progeny. And, and so both are viable targets. Um, the first study that was actually done of CAR T cells um, in, in myeloma actually did look at uh, CD19-directed CAR T cells. And this was a study that, uh, that we did a number of years ago where we took patients with myeloma who um, had had a very short duration of remission after an autologous stem cell transplant, less than one year of remission. Um, and generally, if those patients get a second transplant, the likelihood of that transplant leading to a prolonged remission is, 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 is low. Um, and so those patients, we treated 10 patients, and then um, uh, and, and if they needed a second transplant or a salvage transplant, we then did that transplant, but this time we gave an infusion of CD19-directed CAR T cells to see if the addition of that to the transplant would lead to a, re, uh, a remission that lasted even longer. And this is um, the report of the patient that um, uh, was the first patient on this study who had a very um, heavily pretreated myeloma, had had a prior transplant. Even with the prior transplant, it did not go into complete remission. She then went on to like uh, nine different other lines of therapy, and finally she became eligible for this trial. She got a, 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 a lower dose of high-dose melphalan and a stem cell transplant and the infusion of these CD19-directed T cells and went into a complete remission. And, um, and that remission um, has lasted, uh, lasted for about 15 months. She had one plasma cytoma that came back that has been radiated and is now over uh, three years from, uh, from that treatment. Um, so CD19-directed CAR T cells, some promising, but perhaps not uh, universal uh, to the population that are treated. BCMA, however, is much more commonly seen in uh, pla the malignant plasma cells. And this is a report of the first study, which was from the National Institutes of Health, where they took patients with relapsed and refractory myeloma, and this time they gave what we call lymphodepleting chemotherapy, cytoxan and fludarabine, and then infused um, CAR T cells in, at various doses. Um, and these were all patients who were, had a lot of 
uh, prior therapies and a lot of disease. And this is a report of about 12 of those patients. And as they increased the dose of the infusion of the cells, they found more and more of those patients responded very nicely to the therapy. There were some people who went into complete remission, and some of these remissions lasted for many months, even though these patients had very heavily treated disease. Uh, there, uh, and, and this just shows that um, the patients were full of myeloma before treatment, and then by the time they uh, had uh, recovered from the treatment with the BCMA car, there was no evidence of, of disease. I wanted to show you, um, and now, there, and because of that success from the NIH, there's been a number of other studies that you'll hear about in a second that have looked at BCMA-directed CAR T cells. And the, the, what I what I show you with this slide is the first patient that we treated um, at Penn with uh, the BCMA-directed CAR T cells. This was a 66-year-old uh, gentleman who had 11 prior lines of therapy, had really very few other options. Uh, didn't even receive any of those that lymphodepleting therapy, and just received uh, two doses, um, uh, one day at a time, a 10% dose and a 30% dose of the infusion of these BCMA-directed CAR T cells, and within 28 days went into a complete remission of of uh, of the myeloma uh, with persistence of the CAR T cells and expansion of the CAR T cells, and that was over 30 months ago, and he remains in complete remission. So definitely, with the, all of the da all of the studies, all the science, and all of the uh, the wonderful um, heroic uh, acts of our patients to participate in these trials over the last 20 years has led to scientific evidence and clinical evidence that this approach can result in long-term um, survival for patients with heavily treated disease. And I'm going to stop there, and Jesus will now talk to you about uh, more of the uh, of, of the the studies, and then what the future holds. Thank you, Ed. Uh, very very nice introduction, and thank you all for joining us today. So, uh, just to piggyback on what Ed said, uh, I think uh, BCMA clearly has been the target. Uh, uh, that seems to be the most promising to date uh, in myeloma. So in this uh, table here, I list the studies that are the most advanced against BCMA, but as you'll see later, there's actually quite a few more studies that are ongoing. Uh, but the first uh, column there is the NCI study that Ed uh, talked to us about that was the first uh, study that presented that data uh, with BCMA, and they had very nice responses, very heavily pretreated patients. So if you see in the second row here, that shows you how many lines of therapy patients have had, uh, and it goes from three to four up to ten prior lines of therapy. So these are patients who pretty much have failed all of these standard treatments. Uh, and as you can see, they had an overall response of 81%, complete remission 16%, but they also had quite a bit of toxicity, and Ed alluded to some of the toxicities, like cytokine release syndrome, neurotoxicity, uh, and these can be, we know a lot more about how to manage them, but in these early studies, they were very difficult uh, and did uh, cause a lot of morbidity. Uh, the second study that you solicited there is the Penn study uh, of the patient that uh, Ed uh, talked about, uh, and, uh, and that study uh, has accrued uh, 24 patients. And as you can see, also very nice responses of 53%, uh, but also uh, not without toxicity. And on the last column, you see the Juno study, which is a uh, study that's actually very early on, so I'm not really going to talk too much about it other than that it's open for accrual. But the two um, studies that probably have had the most experience and the most uh, published data out there and have generated uh, uh, the most interest thus far are the Bluebird study as well as the Legend study. Uh, the Bluebird study um, uh, just presented its data at this last uh, EHA uh, just actually last month. Uh, and so we presented data on 43 patients uh, now. Uh, and the Legend study uh, presented page, uh, data on 35 patients. So again, the, the studies with the most uh, patients. The Bluebird uh, study, uh, as you can see, the population very heavily pretreated like the other studies, seven prior lines of therapy, uh, and with an overall response of 81% and complete remission rate of 47%. Um, the 
cytokine release syndrome was seen as well as the, the other studies, but the majority of the cytokine release syndrome was grade one and two. And so when you're looking at, at the actual reporting of toxicities, it's important to look at the grading. Uh, usually grades one and two tend to be milder forms of the toxicity, and grades three and four, uh, or even up to five, of course, um, can are much more uh, dangerous forms. And so, as you can see in the Bluebird study, uh, only 5% of patients had grade three to four toxicity compared to with the original NCI study, which saw 37%. Uh, the legend, again, uh, showed incredible responses as well with 100% of oral response, 63% uh, stringent complete remission, uh, and again, cytokine release, but mostly grade one and two. Uh, the one caveat with the LEGEND study is that, uh, as is the standard of care in China, uh, they don't have access to as many of the medications that uh, we have in the Western world, and so the prior therapies, alliance of therapy, were less, and also exposure to things like daratumumab and pomalidomide uh, were not present because of the availability in that country. So just to look at some of the more specifics of the BB2121 trial, uh, this is just a, a way of showing you sort of how quickly uh, patients who respond, uh, respond. On the left side, we have the serum M protein, which is your monoclonal protein, your abnormal protein that some of you, uh, that some of your myelomas uh, may make. And, and that, as you can see in the patients who were treated at the doses that were active, uh, dropped very nicely. But you can see that it actually dropped very slowly, and that's how, something that's actually important to note. Uh, because the the protein uh, measurements actually lag behind uh, the actual killing of the tumor cells, as I'll show you in a second. On the right-hand side is the serum-free light chains, and those, the half-life is much shorter, so uh, in the patients that responded, those dropped very quickly by four weeks and stayed down uh, in those patients. And here is just another depiction of the actual tumor cells. So on the left-hand side, you have pictures of the bone marrow. So if you see brown, the very first column, that's the, the baseline bone marrow, and brown means that there's myeloma uh, there. Uh, as you get rid of the brown and it becomes blue, that means that you've eradicated the myeloma cells. And as you can see, by day 14, in, in two of these patients, uh, you had complete eradication of the myeloma cells that remained out to six months uh, or nine months in this one patient. On the right-hand side is the a description of one patient that had actual plasmacytomas or tumors made of myeloma cells uh, that light up on this PET scan. So the baseline scan uh, shows you uh, the, the white uh, uptake is tumor, uh, and of course there's normal uptake in the bladder and the brain as well. But as you can see, one month out, you see very little of that white uptake uh, remaining, and by month six, uh, all that uptake is gone, which implies that the uh, plasmacytomas uh, plasma uh, have been eradicated. This is actually the most up-to-date data from the uh, BB2121 uh, Bluebird study. Uh, this was just presented again in June uh, of this year. And as you can see, what's interesting is that there is an actual dose response. So if you look at the left uh, uh, bar graph here, you see that at uh, 50 million cells, which we consider to be an inactive dose, there was a one very transient response out of three patients. But then in the patients that got 150 million cells versus the patients that got more than 150 million cells, you see that there are very nice responses, but they clearly increase with the increasing doses. So at the 150, the overall response was 57%, uh, and at the uh, greater than 150, the overall response was 95.5%. The other thing that's important in this study, um, uh, one of the questions is whether we need to be checking for BCMA expression. Uh, we, uh, BCMA should be expressed on myeloma cells, but some patients are considered higher expressors versus others. Uh, so in this study, we actually did look at that, and as you can see uh, in this, uh, in this gra uh, bar graph on the right, uh, at 450 million cells, uh, it did not matter whether you were a low expressor or a high expressor. The overall responses were very similar, 91% versus 100%. So it does not appear that the amount of BCMA expression uh, is important for these CAR T cells to work. In terms of the toxicity, this is just a reminder again of the different toxicities uh, Dr. Stoudemire uh, presented to you earlier with potential uh, with CAR T cells. Again, cytokine release syndrome uh, was seen in the, uh, the majority of patients, uh, but very little grade two, three. Same with neurotoxicity. And neurotoxicity can be as simple as if you have some mild confusion with a high fever, that may be considered a grade one neurotoxicity. But of course, it can be as bad as having uh, stroke-like symptoms, seizures, and even coma, uh, and that would be considered more of a grade four neurotoxicity. Um, and so, as you can see, this occurs, but again, the majority of it is uh, low grade uh, with high grades, only one patient. Uh, had high-grade neurotoxicity. 
Um, and, the, and the slide on the, uh, the bar graph on the right shows us the uh, percentage of cytokine release syndrome definitely increased with increased cells infused. So 150 was 39% of the patients had cytokine release syndrome, and a grade of 150 was 82%. But the important thing is that the grade of uh, cytokine release did not increase. Uh, the majority of the increase was due to grade one cytokine release syndrome, which basically meant these patients had a fever. Um, and so not all cytokine release syndrome uh, is necessarily bad. That is a good sign of activity. Uh, and so having cytokine release syndrome can be scary, but for the most part is very manageable, as uh, was stated uh, before. This is just a list uh, of CAR T cell trials uh, that are ongoing. Uh, and so, again, it's just to illustrate that there are many CAR T trials throughout the country and actually now throughout the world. Uh, so, it's, uh, so, hopefully, there should be a center near you uh, that should be conducting some of these trials. So where are we going from here? So uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, CAR T's have been approved uh, for lymphoma and, uh, and acute lymphocytic leukemia, but not for multiple myeloma. So uh, the KARMA trial is Celgene's global approval trial of the BB2121 CAR T's that I presented earlier. Uh, and this trial is actually uh, ongoing, accruing, uh, and probably has the lead in terms of potentially the first trial that may get FDA approval of one of these CAR T products in myeloma. Uh, the LEGEND trial, which is the, the Chinese CAR-Ts, uh, now in conjunction with Janssen, uh, they will be starting their pivotal trial here in the United States. And actually, it is now open. The first patient had their cells uh, collected uh, last week. So they uh, uh, are moving forward. Uh, and of course, their others are not far behind. So one of the uh, things that we're seeing now, of course, as we're uh, treat more and more patients is that patients, unfortunately, uh, can relapse. And so understanding why CAR T cells uh, stop working in some patients versus others is, uh, is important as we continue to design these uh, newer generation or next generations uh, of CAR T cells. Um, we also don't understand why some patients have toxicity versus others. There are some indications that perhaps the tumor burden, meaning how much tumor is in your system, uh, may correlate with higher risk of toxicity. That is not uh, uh, a black and white question. Uh, and so it's important to understand these toxicities, how to uh, mitigate them and prevent uh, major toxicities. But now newer, to newer CAR-Ts are being designed that may have safety switches or suicide genes in them uh, that if the CAR-T product is too toxic that they can be eliminated. Uh, so again, all those things are uh, currently being um, uh, evaluated uh, and should be in the clinic uh, in the next year or so. Uh, and one of the other things, of course, is how do we expand the access? So right now, uh, you have to have myeloma that basically is refractory to all FDA-approved uh, indications and drugs to qualify. Uh, so uh, as you will be seeing, new clinical trials opening up uh, and trying to move these CAR Ts uh, forward so that you don't have to wait that long, that perhaps we can introduce them earlier in the course of the disease. Uh, and of course, the other thing is uh, this requires that we collect uh, T cells from you. Uh, and we know that uh, the T cells in a myeloma patient don't always function perfectly normal. So uh, would it be better to actually use um, normal donors' uh, T cells? Or uh, the other problem is there is a significant delay in the manufacturing of the T cells. So once you collect your T cells when you're your own donor, you have to wait about a month before you can actually get the cells infused. What if we had cells that were made from a normal donor that can be given at any time immediately as soon as you need them? So that's the so-called allogeneic, off-the-shelf, universal CAR Ts uh, that I'll show a slide in a second. So in terms of the next generation of CAR-Ts, um, one of the things that we're looking at is, again, when you put in your CAR-Ts, they go in and they're active and they start killing. Um, and we can't necessarily control them too well. They seem to be functioning well. But if some people do have significant toxicity, well, what if you actually made a new generation of CAR-Ts and the so-called sort of uh, armor CAR-T is shown here, which is basically your standard CAR-T is here. Uh, but instead of actually um, having it activated all the time, perhaps it actually acts like a little bit like a Trojan horse, where it has uh, uh, the ability to, once it's infused into the patient uh, and it, it uh, sees uh, uh, the myeloma cell, to then uh, 
uh, release cytokines that actually activate itself and it allows it to replicate further uh, and only in the presence of the tumor. And again, those are the kind of things that are happening uh, in the laboratory. So uh, very exciting type of uh, changes, so much, much more sophisticated CAR T cells uh, than the original generation. Uh, and then again, uh, just to reinforce the idea of a universal CAR T cell, uh, this would be, again, a T cell from a uh, from a normal donor, so not too dissimilar from having a transplant from a, from a normal donor, so-called allogeneic transplant, but in this case it's the T cells that then get manufactured as CAR T cells. But one of the problems when you use a different donor is that they uh, those T cells may not recognize uh, your normal cells and can actually attack your body, and we call that graft versus host disease, and that can be very dangerous. So one of the ways to try to mitigate that is not only are you going to do uh, additions and add the CAR, but perhaps you can actually delete uh, parts of the T cell that make it inactive against anything that is not the actual target. And so uh, those, uh, again, those are being manufactured as we speak, and there are several companies working on this. Uh, and so we should have some clinical trials probably as early as uh, uh, first quarter of 2019 uh, looking at some of these in myeloma. There actually is already a, a trial ongoing in acute lymphocytic leukemia. So there's a lot of excitement over CAR-Ts, and I think rightfully so. We're seeing response rates that uh, we uh, have never seen before uh, in patients uh, with very refractory disease. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to be cognizant of the fact that these are uh, toxic, uh, potentially toxic therapies, uh, and as long as the toxicity is recognized and intervened quickly, uh, it's reversible, uh, but for, because of that, it is limited to certain centers. Uh, and so uh, as, as this evolves, hopefully these will become more and more available uh, throughout, um, you know, the world and, and hopefully available to you even out, out of uh, clinical trials, but for now they remain under clinical trials only. Um, we still don't know the long-term outcome of CAR-Ts, so again, a lot of these trials are early. Uh, the, uh, we know that some patients are having very long-term remissions, but there are some patients that are relapsing. Uh, so uh, it's still, again, we need to see how long these work. Are they working uh, well enough to justify the complexity of the therapy? Uh, so again, a lot more to come as we as these uh, studies mature. Uh, and then in terms of the targets, we've talked uh, much about BCMA, uh, and that will remain a very viable target. But uh, clearly, there's a potential that perhaps you can uh, target multiple uh, targets, uh, as Dr. Stoudemire mentioned before. CD19 and BCMA may be a nice combination, uh, and of course, there are others. Uh, as well, uh, and so as the CAR T's become more sophisticated, uh, these will continue to uh, improve. So um, with that, I think I will um, stop and I will pass it on to Frank. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start with an apology. Uh, I'm just a layman here, so what you're going to hear from me is uh, is layman terms. Uh, moving forward, you guys can. You guys can clean it up with the uh, with the real uh, with the real terms uh, later on, I guess, or if uh, follow at it. So, yeah, I'm a patient of Dr. Stoudemire. So here's the question: uh, You know, I, I've had the CAR T uh, trial. I've had it uh, um, nearly a year ago, and uh, the question is: You know, did uh, the trial help me? Uh, so a little background. Um, I've had multiple myeloma at least diagnosed uh, for nearly uh, 10 years, and um, it smoldered for a while and then got active. And But I have to say, I've had, uh, compared to what could have been, I, I've had a relatively easy ride until about, uh, until about a couple of years ago. So way back in 2010, I had the first uh, real therapies. I had eight rounds of uh, Velcade. Uh, Rivermid and uh, and Dex. Um, in those days, it didn't treat people who were smoldering. You had a, uh, the the disease had to start to get active to get the, to get this kind of uh, treatment. Um, and I had I had a, a what what was called a a a beautiful partial response. Okay, um, and then for the next six years, and and at that point, I was under the care of uh, of Dr. Ken Anderson up at Dana Farber, fabulous doctor and a wonderful person. Um, and I took a pill a day. That that was it. I mean, I took Rivlimid first for about five years, just a pill a day with very minor side effects. 
when that stopped working, I had uh, Pomalist uh, related to Rivlin, and that worked for a year virtually to the day. Um, one of the days that I remember significantly is July 3rd, 2016, when I fell down backwards down a flight of stairs in my doctor's house. Now, I, I wasn't really injured, uh, but we didn't know what happened there. I, well, how did I misstep and how did I fall? So in treatment, we realized that I had a softball-sized tumor on my left hip uh, that compromised my leg, and that's, that's why I went down the stairs. And um, so since then, I've, I've really had a parade of, of therapies and treatments. Of, obviously, we radiated uh, the hip. Uh, then I had powerful chemotherapies uh, and, um, and, and uh, then a stem cell uh, transplant. Now, uh, in between, I had some, some DARA. That only worked for about four months. The chemo was very tough. I uh, lost all my hair, including my eyebrows. Uh, I really look scary, even myself. Um, and and then the stem cell transplant, which we had at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, actually didn't work. I mean, I had three new tumors uh, at the end of the stem cell. So so clearly, I, I was running out of I was running out of options. And um, my doctor at at Sloan Kettering, that's the, Sergio Geralt, another wonderful person and guy. Um, he started calling all over the country. I was too, trying to find an immunotherapy uh, for me. And we called from you know from Seattle to Hackensack, New Jersey, and we were not getting anywhere. Um, I, I mean, at that point, we thought that immunotherapy was uh, the best route for me. I knew that immunotherapy. Uh, I knew that immunotherapy. Sorry, sorry, running out of options. So I knew that immunotherapy uh, worked because I had written a, a, a cover story for Parade Magazine about Lori Alf, another uh, a patient of Dr. Stoudmire, who um, who was cured, uh, and she had a terrible myeloma, and has now been cancer free for for three years. So. But still, I knew the odds were against me, and, and so we proceeded. Now, Dr. Stoudemire used the word heroic. Uh, I, I'm saying brave here. I, I was never heroic. I didn't feel like a hero at all. I, I was running out of options, and I believe I was very, very fortunate to get the last slot uh, at a trial at the University of Pennsylvania with Dr. Stoudemire. Uh, and, and it was – here's really my experience – uh, we went down there. The nurse, nurses uh, extracted my, my disease-fighting uh, T cells, as, as doctors have, have alluded to. Uh, and it was like giving a transfusion. It was just an, uh, a tube into one arm, a tube into another, through a machine that collected this peach-colored uh, T cells. Then the cells were taken over to the lab. They were weaponized. That took a little while. And then it was uh, essentially just um, infused back into my body, uh, over over a three day period because it, it it is powerful medicine so it was ten percent then thirty percent then sixty percent and on that last day uh, when I got to sixty percent everyone was expecting me uh, to get uh, fevers and uh, that would be an indication that uh, that the, that the medicine was working but also I'd have to be under hospital care well guess what I didn't get any fevers uh, I got the sixty percent dose the max dose. Uh, I, I got the chills, uh, but then I got a medicine called Dilaudid. I calmed down. I had no fever. And, and Carol and I, my wife, uh, essentially had nine days uh, in Philly, like a, a Philadelphia vacation, uh, but with no fever. And, and, and I knew that other, other trials were shown that patients who get fevers uh, actually do better. So we were having a vacation, but I knew that Dr. Stoudemire was starting to get concerned. Um, <laughs> I can read him. He was starting to worry a bit. Uh, but then I got a fever. And then I got fevers with a vengeance. I had fevers actually for 24, the next 26 days. At, at the worst of it, uh, under hospital care, obviously, I was getting three a day. I'd, I'd get the chills. I'd get the Dilaudid medicine, which would calm it down. Then I'd get fever. And then, and then they'd break the fever, and I'd get these, these terrible sweats. And that would – three a day was cereal. Uh, so, and after, after 14 days, the doctors came to me and said, well, look, we do have this medicine, uh, 
as was mentioned, and we can we can essentially shut down uh, the fevers. But I I I went with the fever. I knew that people who got fevers did better. I just hung in there with the, uh, with the fevers and the sweats. Uh, so did it pay off? Uh, yes, it did. I, I, I've been in. I've been in complete remission uh, now for 11 months. We call it remish because I don't push my luck here. Um, and and the doctors, you know, honestly, as the doctors have said, they don't know how long these CAR T cells will work. Will it work for another 20 days, another 20 months? We, we just don't know. Another 20 years, that'd be wonderful. Um, next month, I go back down to University of Pennsylvania for a head-to-toe PET scan to see if my tumors are still inactive, and if I'm clean, uh, doctors say they don't really need to see me for another year. So, look, I had a bad break in an otherwise very, very lucky life, uh, and and I'd say that I'm tremendously grateful for the care I've gotten at every step, from Dana-Farber, from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and most importantly, from the University of Pennsylvania under Dr. Stoudemire. Thank you. Thanks so much, Frank, for that really interesting presentation from a patient's point of view. And thanks also to Dr. Stattmauer and Dr. Berdeha for their presentations. And so now we're going to move into the question and answer uh, portion of today's webinar. As a reminder to everyone in the audience, if you'd like to ask the presenters a question, please type it into the Q&A box and click Enter. The questions will be answered in the order in which they were received, but unfortunately, due to time constraints, we might not be able to answer all of your questions. So I'm going to start off with a question for um, Dr. Berdeha. And um, Dr. Berdeha, you and Dr. Stottmauer showed quite a bit of really interesting data from the BB2121 trial um, and the LEGEND trial. but um, when looking at this data and listening to presentations at um, the recent ASCO and EHA um, meetings that took place, can you talk to us about um, what's, the, what's the typical um, length of time in remission for patients who receive CAR-T therapy? So that's, that's a very insightful question. It's a very good question. Um, the, the truth is we actually don't know. Um, so the data for the, so to be able to get what we call progression-free survival or overall survival data, you need to wait long enough for most of the patients to receive the treatment to have had their treatment and, and see how long they stay in remission. And so, um, and so the data that you, that was presented with the BB2121, um, was really just data on the initial cohort of patients in the dose escalation. So I believe it was only 18 patients. Um, and so the bulk of the patients in the what we call the expansion phase uh, were too early to really uh, be able to determine that. But in that small cohort of patients, and again, these were at doses that were variable, so that was in the dose escalation, they all got different doses, the median progression-free survival was uh, 11 point uh, seven months, which is close to uh, a year. Um, and so uh, just to put that in perspective, uh, daratumumab uh, was approved um, in the United States for treatment of myeloma in a patient population that was a little bit less heavily pretreated because all of the patients in the CAR-T trials have also failed daratumumab. And there, the median progression-free survival was 3.9 months. So again, uh, you know, very sort of impressive uh, data um, obviously, we would like to see that people remain in remission much longer, uh, but again, it's still very early on uh, in that uh, in that arena, I guess. Thank you. So I'm going to ask this question of Dr. Statmauer. So there were a couple of patients who uh, wrote in talking about eligibility for uh, CAR-T trials. Um, you said during the presentation that patients basically need to be refractory to every treatment before they're eligible for CAR-T. Um, so at some time, hopefully, this, um, this type of treatment will move uh, earlier into the myeloma course. But for right now, are there any medications or treatments that make patients ineligible for a CAR-T treatment? Um, you know, good question, of course. Um, the uh, the the reality is there are 
unfortunately, many different um, clinical trials and uh, of, of cellular therapy of, of CAR T cells and others. And each one has its um, nuances in terms of eligibility um, and exclusion. Um, you know, the, the, the most important thing is uh, they want to make sure whenever they do a clinical trial, you want to make sure that the patients are, li are best likely to benefit and least likely to be hurt from a, uh, a trial. So, so I, don't th I wouldn't think of it too much as an exclusionary sort of process. It's really uh, trying to identify the people who will uh, answer the questions uh, that are important and, and best benefit and, less, and be not hurt. Um, because of the success of the, um, the earliest trials of, of uh, CAR T cells, um, I would say that the the current trials are not as um, uh, for the last hope or last ditch effort for patients. Um, there are a number of trials that are taking patients that are relatively early in the course of their disease. Remember, we have um, um, uh, a lot of information or more and more information, many of it from the MMRF uh, 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 studies uh, that are showing uh, bio biological risk. Uh, factors and and there's a number of studies that are that are looking at the high risk uh, myeloma patients and relatively early in the course of the disease consider CAR T cell therapies or investigational maybe different targets maybe combinations uh, for that group of patients so 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 I wouldn't go into it assuming that um, that you you really have to be on your last legs in order to be eligible for a trial I think it's really important for uh, communication between um, patients and their their physicians, and also organizations like MMRF to uh, to to get a, a sense of 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 the availability of clinical trials and uh, and what might be best for them. Thank you. So Frank, there were a number of people that wrote in for questions uh, for you, and so one um, question asked about how long patients stay in the hospital for CAR-T um, therapy. So you mentioned your fevers, et cetera, and were you in the hospital for a long time, and do you think that that amount of time was an average amount of time for a CAR-T patient, or longer or shorter? I, I think it was relatively average, um, and I was in for roughly uh, 21 to 25 days, something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I remember when I walked in, when I finally walked in, uh, I, I had fever. I wasn't waiting around for anything. I was being treated, and treating treated very well, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure that Dr. Statmauer and his staff are happy to hear that. So, well, um, I would say I would say the food is not necessarily the best, but the, <laughs> but the nurses are, are 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 the best. Well, that's good. <laughs> Good to know, good to know. Um, so uh, Dr. Statmauer, you did mention a little bit um, about high-risk patients and CAR-T therapy, and there were a couple of people that wrote in asking about that, whether, um, whether patients who have high-risk myeloma would be better candidates for CAR-T or maybe they wouldn't be candidates for CAR-T, um, and are they uh, considered to be maybe a, a population of interest for uh, CAR-T therapy? Yeah, no, definitely it is a, is a population of interest. Um, given that, um, though fortunately for 80% of our, uh, our patients who have uh, what we call standard risk myeloma, the, the last 30 years have been miracles for, for those patients and the advances have been uh, rapid and, and wonderful. Um, we still have about 20% of our patients who have, even from the initial diagnosis of their disease, um, biologically much more uh, difficult diseases. And, and we know that the standard um, approaches just don't result in the majority of those patients doing well for a long time. So, so I think it's a very uh, important group of patients to look for innovative uh, therapies. And, um, and because of that, there are a number of, uh, of, of uh, CAR-T trials uh, that uh, have been um, generated for for that group of patients, either looking in the uh, uh, first remission, perhaps instead of a uh, an autologous transplant, trying uh, the CAR T cell therapy uh, for patients who relapse 
um, maybe right after their first line of therapy, if they have high risk um, features, to uh, to also consider that. So you know, I think, but I think the most important philosophy of of anything is is any time the disease uh, relapses or or um, or suggests that it's not going along in the in the standard way, that's the time when the physician and the patient need to sit down and really look through all of the potential options. You know, I do this probably in the course of my relationship with a patient. I probably do this. 10 or 20 times uh, just to, to really think of what would be the logical thing and then consider if there's uh, something available. And as, as Jesus said, the good news is, is these, these technologies have been, um, uh, really are throughout the nation at this point, in fact, throughout the world. And, uh, and so almost everyone will have uh, access to a center that has some expertise in this area within a relatively reasonable uh, commuting distance. So along those lines, Dr. Berdeja, um, you can tell that patients are watching the news because there were a number of people who asked about the recent changes to, to the Bluebird trial as far as the escalation in dose and the, and the number of patients that are being enrolled. So can you comment on that? Uh, yes, so I think the um, part of this, again, this is all the moving targets. It's very early. That's the trial that's sort of kind of leading the way. So I think one of, one of the problems with that is that you don't have the benefit of kind of seeing the experience of uh, um, other other trials. So uh, it was actually the changes they made were largely based on the on the slide I presented with the dose uh, response curve, where we actually are finding that actually the higher uh, doses. Uh, seem to be better. Uh, so there definitely seems to be almost like a threshold of how many cells have to be given. So because of that, uh, the original expectation, or at least what we had seen originally, was that anything 150 or above appeared to be uh, have the same responses. We're finding that that's not the case, and that's why the, the KARMA trial was uh, adjusted to, to that end to make sure that we are getting to the right dose levels. Thank you. So, um, and there's been a number of patients who are sort of, um, you know, asking questions about CAR-T um, that relate back to sort of more standard therapy. And it may be too early to really answer these questions, Dr. Stattmauer, but so quest patients asked the questions of whether or not if you have a CAR-T and then relapse after CAR-T, can a CAR-T therapy be repeated? Or if you have CAR-T therapy, um, is maintenance therapy required after um, CAR-T is given? Yeah, those are, those are also excellent questions. In terms of um, uh, what can you do should the CAR-T cell therapy fail, um, the, the good news is um, those patients in general can be treated like any other patient. Um, in, in the past, since most of the studies um, uh, were primarily um, for patients who really had no other options, then obviously there weren't that many options. But, but as, uh, this, as these studies are being used earlier and earlier, um, uh, there are potentially options. I have, I have a, uh, a couple of patients now who have uh, progressed after a CAR T-cell trial, but they fortunately had an 11-14 translocation and and we know that that medication venetoclax can be very active in that area. And so I've had patients who have been very uh, heavily treated. Um, they even had CAR T cells. They progress. I put them on venetoclax. They go into a beautiful remission. So 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 it's it again goes to the 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 philosophy I have is that whenever something happens that changes the character, you have to really just sit down and use uh, your creativity, imagination, and 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 knowledge of all of that is available, and frequently we're able to come up with some concoction uh, that will be uh, helpful for the patients. Um, the one and one one exclusion that we sometimes see is um, if you've had a donor transplant, if you have an allogeneic transplant. But even that, uh, we are we're learning more and more that if they don't have uh, complications from that procedure. And, um, and are progressing. Many of the studies are even opening up the, 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 the treatment for that group of patients. That sounds so promising. 
So um, we're just about out of time. Frank, there were a number of people that wrote in and congratulated you on your success with CAR-T so far, um, wishing you continued success. And there's a number of people that want to be able to keep up with your progress. Is there a way for them to do that? And do you have like a, a blog that you write or anything like that that people can, can stay abreast of how you're doing with your therapy? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, so I, I have this regular um, uh, job for uh, NPR through Robinhood Radio. So if you go to Robinhood Radio and hit uh, the demand button in demand and you can find me and I'm, I'm talking about my, how I'm doing and uh, also just general questions about uh, health care, how to get better treatment uh, if, potentially for less money than you're paying now. I try to cover the whole, I try to cover the whole field as best I can. So that's where you can find me, uh, Robin Hood Radio through NPR. Great. Let me, Thanks let me so much. Say, let me say that Frank is a wonderful resource, and uh, uh, as well as a wonderful person, and uh, and 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 we are inspired and motivated by by uh, by many such patients uh, who we've been treating. Thanks, Dr. Statmauer and, and Frank also, and it's really inspiring to listen to the two of you and, um, and the relationship that you have. It's, it's really just um, really hopeful. This is a really hopeful time, uh, I think, in myeloma. Thank you both for your presentations. Thank you also, Dr. Berdea Ha, for your presentation um, as well. So that's all the time we have today for questions. And on behalf of the MMRF, um, again, thanks to our presenters today. And thank you for everyone on the webinar who's listening. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, Abdi, Amgen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Celgene, Genentech, Janssen, Carrier Farm, Novartis, and Takeda Oncology for sponsoring this webinar today. We are continuing with our MMRF webinar series. Um, coming up, we have one more um, webinar in our immunotherapy webinar series that will be coming up on August 15th, and it's going to be talking about myeloma vaccines with a couple of very uh, eminent uh, immunotherapy uh, physicians in um, myeloma. So we're looking forward to that, and please visit our website there to register. We also have a couple of live programs coming up um, in the fall, and these are full-day educational uh, programs for myeloma patients that we offer in, in various cities around the U.S. So in September, you can see that we're going to be visiting Dr. Berdeha in Nashville. Hey, Suze, you're going to be tired of talking to me after all this is done, right? Because we've been together so much this year. Um, and, then, uh, in, <laughs> and then in October, we're going to be going to Washington, D.C. Um, for another program on October 6th. So we're looking forward to those two summits. Um, and for more information or to register for these uh, summits, please, again, visit our website. Um, MMRF does have a lot of resources for um, multiple myeloma patients. We have a really great MMRF patient support center that is staffed by uh, nurses who are very well versed in all things myeloma. So please call. Um, they're available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Time to answer any of the questions that you have about myeloma and to offer all types of resources that you might need throughout your disease journey. Um, also, again, stay connected with us via our website and also on Twitter and on Facebook um, to, to uh, be kept abreast of all of the latest developments in myeloma that are ongoing. <laughs>